Welcome to Designer Discussions with Jason, Miriam, and Maria. Today, we're going to talk about wellness in the interior design industry with our guest, Jamie Go. Welcome to the Designer Discussions podcast. Tune in each week where we discuss marketing, branding, PR, and business advice for design professionals. Excellent. Jamie, welcome to the Designer Discussions podcast. Um, I'm super excited to have Jamie here with us. Um, Jamie is a wellness design consultant, and she's the author of three books. Um, we'll give you more information on that um, at the end of the podcast. She's also a um, Mayo Clinic certified wellness coach and a regular contributor to Forbes and Kitchen and Bath Design News. She has a lot of other um, um, titles to her name, actually, but you really are the expert about wellness um, in design and 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 what how it can help the interior design process and why it's important. And that's all we want to talk about today. So welcome, Jamie. Well, thank you. One of my favorite topics. I figured. I <laughs> Excellent. So let's dive right in. Um, it's like my, and I'm going to ask this question as a non-designer, right? I know you're a designer and a writer and you're an expert in many different areas, but like for, for um, us who are not as well versed in it, it's like, what, what does wellness have to do with design? Why is it important? Well, it has everything to do with design because every professional in the field create spaces that work for their clients in every way possible from being safe, which of course is in all the design guidelines, whether it's ASID or NKBA or you know, whatever they're working with, safety is always a key component and safety is a component of wellness design. And then you talk about healthy and supporting the health and well-being of the client and you know, just in every way, every aspect touches on some facet of wellness design. And wellness design, again, is, is such a huge topic. I don't think any one of us is an expert in all areas, but we all have backgrounds in some, whether it's accessibility, which is what I consider one of the five facets of wellness design, is accessibility, safety, as I mentioned, uh, health and fitness, whether you're designing a bathroom that supports somebody's personal hygiene, a kitchen that supports their nutrition, those are all health and fitness areas. Outside the kitchen, designing a bedroom that optimizes sleep, designing a home office that optimizes ergonomics, those are all health and fitness topics. Functionality, I consider part of wellness design, and you have fat elements like say induction cooking which is great for safety great for health and fitness but also functionality it just is faster to get dinner on the table and it's faster to clean easier to clean and then everyone's favorite i think is comfort and joy and that of course contributes to a client's emotional mental well-being so all of those so many of us so many designers are involved in you know in creating spaces especially where people live Yes, thank you for um, for listing those five. I, was, I think it's fascinating, and I know that you you have been focused on this topic for many many years, yeah. and it has just become so much more relevant and 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 widely acknowledged mm -hmm. um, over the last two years during the pandemic. Can you speak a little bit to how the perception of it all has changed during that time? Oh, absolutely. When I was pitching the book to publishers, it, was, it wasn't it was a new concept to anyone in the design industry, but it was a new concept for a lot of homeowners, for people you know who live in homes, condos, townhouses, whatever it is. People think I want to get healthy. They don't think I'm going to redo my kitchen or bathroom or my living room or my bedroom. They think I'll eat more vegetables or I'll get more sleep or whatever it is. And of course that ties into your home space. I found a publisher, Simon and Schuster, that was looking at wellness, decided to publish the book. And just as we were getting ready to go to press, COVID struck and the lockdowns happened. 
and bookstores closed and Amazon was only shipping hand sanitizers and you know, all, all of the things you needed to deal with this suddenly new phenomenon. And the world ran out of toilet paper for some reason that I still haven't figured out why. But if you had a bidet functionality, if your client had bidet functionality, you were in much better position than someone who didn't. And if your surfaces were easier to clean and you were worried about you know, where your kids were eating, what your family was bringing into the house, well, that made your life easier too. And of course you were cooking more meals at home suddenly. So everything about your home environment was either supporting or sabotaging your your convenience, your sanity, your health, all of it. So people really did start to make that connection. And that has only increased in the past two years. Yeah. So when, when you think about a designer working with a client, it's Mm -hmm. like, is that like, how, how should they weave this topic into the process, into the communication? It's like, It's how should they talk to their client and maybe how should they not? Well, in terms of talking to their client, I think it's good that clients are going to be asking more now Mm -hmm. than they would have before. They're thinking about their homes differently because, again, people have been inside for two for most of the last two years. So that, in a sense, is already a good starting point. So I would talk with clients about their health and fitness and safety, their families, you know, their parents, you know, with young kids. So everything is about supporting well-being, physical and mental. In many homes, when you had the kids home from school, maybe you were working from home and your spouse was working from an office and suddenly everyone is there. Maybe the only space in your house you got some peace and quiet was the bathroom. And that was your retreat. Well, now you're talking to people about making that kind of a healthy, nurturing place of respite and relaxation Mm -hmm. and restoration and that is the languaging and now you have a much more receptive audience for that and you know any space you look at you're talking into people's experience of the last two years suddenly you know the the home office you use maybe two hours a day now you're using eight to ten different yeah is your chair supporting you is the light good all of those things So I think it's, you have a more responsive audience, people understand more, and you're coming in as the person with the design expertise and you're making them aware of things they might not have thought of before. It's, it's almost a natural development. It is. Yeah. It's been a huge boost to wellness design overall, because again, now people get it and they want their homes to be easier to live in and easier Mm -hmm. and more functional. And they want it to feel like them suddenly. Yes. Right. So is there like, are there like examples of what you should not say or like maybe ways that people get scared away from it? It's interesting. I, when I was living and working in Florida, I became a certified aging in place specialist. And I thought this is great. Florida has the second largest senior population in the country after Maine. This is going to be fabulous. I'll get all kinds of leads being a caps, you know, designer, and it's going to be fabulous. Well, nobody likes the A word. Nobody wants to think about aging. Nobody wants to talk about aging unless it's someone else in the house they're talking about, not themselves. So I changed my languaging around that. And I think the industry is kind of shifting away from a conversation about aging to a conversation about accessibility and again, functionality and convenience and, and making things work, whatever stage of life you're at. And I tend to put conversations to people in terms of what, how do you work out? What do your exercise programs look like? And often it's something like skiing, say, or it could be running, or it could be mountain climbing, whatever it is. Have you had any injuries related to that? And what if you couldn't use your shower for, you know, a period? What if you were on crutches or, you know, had a temporary condition? I I like to kind of put it in the temporary and, you know, athletic Mm -hmm. conversation 
rather than you're getting older and your body's going to fall apart. Nobody really wants to think about <laughs> that. So, so that's on the, what you might want to avoid and reframe. But I would also caution mm-hmm. designers not to, well, to stay in your lane, basically. This was a, a, an issue that we looked at when I was in the Mayo Clinic program, is you're not a physician. You're probably not a physical therapist or an occupational therapist or someone who is credentialed in a health field. So don't give advice that's outside of your specialty. Great to ask somebody if they have conditions they're under treatment for and to suggest running by any suggestions you make by a member of their health team so that, you know, you're not doing anything that's going to negatively impact that. But again, stay in your lane. I think that's very good advice. Yes. And I love your perspective on what I used to call aging in place. And it's, I I think there's been stigma around that for, for a a very long time. And it's, it's, it's still there to a great degree, but I love the word accessibility. Mm -hmm. Um, So I want everybody to remember that when they talk about that topic, I think that's. Well, accessibility also makes your life easier, regardless Mm -hmm. of your condition. Take, for example, if you have to design a kitchen with a blind corner cabinet, you are going to put a swing out in that corner so that your client doesn't have to get on their knees with flashlight and knee pads. It's just professional consideration. It makes their Mm -hmm. life easier. It makes their their space more functional. So accessibility is not just about disability. It's not just about injury. Mm -hmm. It's also about functionality and convenience and just creating a better working space for the client. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's really, really good information. Thank you, Jamie. Sure. Um, I know Maria has a question um, also about niching in your business. And, and I have a related question to that because wow. as the PR person um, of the trio here, I mean, I know that wellness has been, you're, you're a, a freelance writer and c- contribute to all these different media I'm like, I'd be really interested in your perspective about how the, the, the coverage of the topic has changed in the media. And if you notice that there's more opportunity um, in the wellness space, like I see media write about wellness, everything all the time, you know, and now much more so than even before the pandemic. So do you have any any advice on, for um, our listeners, how they would maybe be able to, to use that um, in their PR and marketing efforts? Well, I would start with what you are most passionate and experienced in. And for different designers, that's going to be different aspects of wellness design. Maybe it is accessibility, universal design. And then you have a lot to share on that, particularly as the population is aging. People are looking for spaces that they can make their own indefinitely, particularly with the housing market going crazy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as a PR pro yourself, you're going to take your expertise, you're going to take your interests, and you're going to tie it into current trends. You're going to find news hooks for Mm -hmm. your area of expertise. I would say look for where your background intersects with today's news. Let's say your focus is on indoor air quality and you you can tie in with the effects of viruses in the indoor environment or wildfire smoke in the indoor environment as we come into wildfire season and making your Mm -hmm. space healthier and more breathable. So that would tie into a news hook and your expertise. Last one I'll mention is there are a lot of people who have gotten credentialed in environmental areas. You're like Mm -hmm. lead AP and such. And there is now a growing connection between what's environmentally sound and what is also wellness sound. A perfect example is phasing out gas cooktops and gas ranges Mm -hmm. because of the pollutants, the methane, the uh, 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 nitrogen oxide and all, you Mm -hmm. know, in those areas, there are toxicities that 
you're more exposed to with a gas range. On the environmental side, they're phasing these out in states like California, cities like New York, other areas, mm -hmm. because of the carbon, you know, the carbonization and, and, um, and, and that end of things, sustainability. So there's an overlap for anyone who comes from the, the sustainability end and now the wellness end. So you can slip into that conversation mm -hmm. as well. So that's, you know, that would be kind of my coaching on that is to look at what you know, what you do and how it relates to current stories and trends. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's really excellent advice. And I love your perspective because you're obviously as, as, a, as a freelance journalist, you're always looking for these hooks yourself. So those are sure. some excellent ideas. Thank you. Sure. Um, Jason and Maria, do you guys have any questions for Jamie? Yes, uh, I had wanted to ask about where you were talking about the niches mm -hmm. and the individual that's happening here. Have you seen growth in the interior design industry where more designers are actually niching into the wellness space? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's so huge because of COVID particularly that designers are looking at where does my practice fit in with this? What am I doing for clients that has a, a wellness dimension? How do I get more credentialed in this area? Uh, one of the popular certifications is the Well AP certification. And for its first years of existence, it was primarily commercial. And now they're developing a single family residential certification and that's going to explode. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're, you have the clip of certified living in place professional, you have uh, CAPS, you know, certified aging in place specialization. We're going to see more and more of that, I believe, because designers want to inform themselves so that they feel even more confident in where their expertise fits in, how to communicate it to clients. And, you know, where the marketing opportunities are, what, what is going to resonate with the press? What is going to resonate with the public? Yeah. So my question is, um, designers don't really like to niche down. They feel like if they, that they are like an expert in one area that then they are like removing themselves from opportunity. Do you feel like that niching is actually niching down into something that you really enjoy is actually something that is beneficial for design businesses? It probably depends on the business, where they're located, how strong that niche is in their area, what the competitive factors are. That's probably something that Jason's got more expertise on than I do. But I think nobody's going to handle all the business in the world. Nobody's going to handle all the business in their city. And I believe pretty strongly that you should do what you love. And if that fits within a niche and you get known for that and there's enough business And in today's environment, you can also work remotely. There are more and more designers handling clients outside of their regions, where if you get known for something, and I have, um, I host a uh, clubhouse session, and I had a designer on who's known for working with people on the spectrum, you know, people with autism and other spectrum uh, conditions. And she gets calls from around the country to work with clients on that. That's a, that is a definite niche and it comes from her background in handling projects for her own family and then for others. So I think there's nothing wrong with niching if, again, it feels like a great fit for you and what you want to be doing a lot of. I would agree 100% with that. I actually talk to a lot of designers that have that same fear. Well, if I niche into X, Y, Z, then I will not be able to do all the other aspects of design that I love. But I usually use it the opposite way. If you niche into what you love to do, it's easier for you to stand above everybody else because mm -hmm. there's a lot of competition out there and you have to differentiate yourselves from all the other designers out there. The other work will come. But if you niche yourself the right way around what you love, then you can grow your name there and then you'll always get a referral for the other work. Yeah. And you'll get repeat business mm -hmm. because you, if you have a client and you designed a bedroom for their autistic child or their deaf child or a spouse with a mobility challenge, 
you are going to get referral. You're going to get repeat business from them. We did a great job on Joe's bedroom mm-hmm. or Steve's bathroom, whatever it is. And you're going to get repeat business and you're going to get referrals. And as an added benefit, you might even get inquiries from the media if you become known as someone who has this expertise yeah. in this area that's a hot topic or it's, it's trending. I think that's so true. And I, I hear this from... Um from editors also it's like because sometimes they don't even know who to go to because everybody is an expert in everything so Mm -hmm. it's very difficult to find the right person so if you do have a niche and you communicate it and it'll start building on itself and you can really build up your 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 presence not just business-wise but in the media as well oh absolutely absolutely and it, it also if you're doing a lot of that work there's a better chance of you're getting good quality photos mm-hmm. to showcase that work. There are so many designers who, you know, I'll reach out to for an article and they don't have any pictures for that area. So having great publication quality images that you have the right to have published online and in print is really helpful to working with the media. Mm-hmm what we preach right (laughs) have professional photography available Mm -hmm. Um, it's worth the investment yes absolutely well jamie this has been super interesting thank you so much um for coming on the podcast we really appreciate it what where do people find more information about you and and your books um if if they're interested well the easiest thing is just remember jamiegold.net and I say .net because .com takes you to the poker player. The same. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to go to jamiegold.net. You'll find links to get the book and where it's available. You'll find two excerpts on the book. You'll find my weekly design blog, Gold Notes, which I've been writing since 2008. And uh, links to articles I've written and uh, links to my clubhouse uh, sessions. The next one, you know, what this the first and third Wednesday of the month, as long as I'm not traveling at some trade show. So thank you very much for including me in this. It's always a pleasure speaking to, you know, fellow designers and and industry colleagues. Well, thank you everybody for listening to designer discussions today. If you have liked what you hear, please subscribe to our podcast and share it with your friends. And we look forward to um, talking to you next week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Designer Discussions. What was your takeaway? Care to share your thoughts and tag Jason, Maria, and Miriam on social media? You can find them on all platforms at designerdiscussions.com. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a review or comment for this episode from wherever you are listening.